Adeliba Shafkat. Um, I'm the founder um, of Impli, and I founded the company in April 2019, um, where I, you know, had a standing job and decided I really wanted to bring this to market, and I saw the opportunities that this could have um, in the world, not only in healthcare, but also in other aspects um, <coughs> of, of the world. Um, my background is uh, varied, so I studied biotechnology at university, um, degreed to the master level, um, then decided to work in the commercial field in the chemical industry, um, and went on to a startup in the genomics spa space, and then went on to work with pharmaceutical companies in their supply chain and the digitalization of the supply chain. Um, and the idea of Impli came by, by, by sheer interest of me having lost my key card. Um, or forgotten my key card, uh, turning up to the, the office and um, uh, being locked out, uh, and eventually having to go all the way back, all the way back home and come back from that. Um, so that's why I said there must be a solution for this really simple problem. Um, and I found one, and I looked into it, and I researched a lot about this technology and where it could help us, and I tried to find the really important applications that this can bring and where will this actually be used because there are different ways to solving different problems. Um, so today I'm going to talk briefly about the history of implantables. I think it's really important to see where we've come to, from and how long it's taken us uh, to get there. Um, then I'm going to touch on where are we right now. So what are we doing right now in the world that can lead us to and through these implantables? Um, and then I'm going to show you some market research that we did as a company um, throughout the last uh, year and throughout the last three months uh, that's going to give us a little bit of insight about what we, you know, what we can do and which fields might be the fields that people are interested in having implantables in. And then I'm going to sp speak about the future a little bit. I mean, nanobots just mentioned by David, which are obviously a, an interesting area, but also other applications of, of implantables that are maybe much more short-term future. So I think the first question that I would like to ask, and I think everyone has a different um, definition at the moment about this, is what is an implantable <laughs> actually? So we've all heard about wearables, and we use wearables all the time. What's an implantable? Um, can, can be really anything. And I'm sure you've all seen implantables in different sectors, um, especially the medical field um, here. But an implantable is actually an artificial object that's capable of being, as a, being inside the skin, so implanted into the body. And now we can think of all of the options out there of what that could be. Uh, and what do we have on a day-to-day -day basis to, to support that? And I think it's quite important to look at um, you know, what has been developed. In the 50s, we developed the pacemaker. Um, and coming from, from that kind of implantable, that's very functional. And we've come from like a big device in a pacemaker. I don't know if you've seen the early days of a pacemaker that was still like, kind of connected, to now kind of this kind of size pacemaker that sits inside your body and controls your heart, essentially. Um, cochlear implants for hearing loss um, and hearing aids. Um, uh, which are the dental implants, which probably many of us have had experiences with and even carry ourselves inside. Um, the contraceptive implant, which 50% of the world, women have the option of getting to the state, which is free by the NHS. Um, and then obviously augmentation or, um, uh, or um, uh, if you have um, ocular implants um, for vision. So this is really where we have come from, from the 50s to now, where we <coughs> use these devices every day to make our lives easier. Um, so personal implantables were very much pioneered by Kevin Warwick, um, and he was a lecturer at Reading University back then. Um, and Karen Warwick in 1998, so actually for us a significantly long time ago, developed our implantable RFID chips that would sit underneath his, in, in his case it was the arm, um, and would control his lights or his office doors. And that was 20 years ago. Um, that was quite a long time ago. And these, you know, it, it brings the question to mind, if Karen Warwick did it in 1998, why have we not adopted this technology by now? What were like the factors behind us not adopting it? And I think it has a lot to do with the development of technology around us, um, not only the actual physical development of, of devices, but also the 
the mentality of devices. So we go from the first computer to the first personal computer to the first mobile phones to the first wearables only in 2009. So after Karen Warwick actually um, brought out this technology, um, going to, to the Internet of Things where there are more devices per person in the world than there are people, um, which already brings a huge factor in that. And then going into the very optimized self movement. So what is the optimized self movement? It's you know people moving towards optimizing themselves to give the best performance. And that can be you know in sports, in in work, in how can I be better? I count my steps when I go out to see if I'm fit enough. I uh, measure my heart rate on a, on a on a regular basis, and so on and so on, which ultimately really leads to the development of the of the Internet of Humans, which in fact comes with implantables because you integrate the human into that whole environment. Um, and that can be done by different things. That doesn't only have to do have to be implantables, that can also be done by biometrics. So we already use fingerprints, we use our facial facial recognition every day. Um, so we're already part of this and we're already going to be part of this for, for the foreseeable future. Now the question is how can implants help that and how can what functionalities can implants really bring to us as humans to, um, uh, to develop and to, to be better. So this very much leads into the where are we right now um, section. If we just explain, like we just explained, um, the optimized self movement going to the uh, internet of humans, we can very much look at this as a circle. Now implantables, very much got used in the biohacking space um, and got adopted in the biohacking space. There's a lot of people out there with implants already. And those were really the experimenters. They started, they looked at this, they said, okay, you know, how can I use it? What can I use it for? What are the different applications of this? Um, and they developed qualitative data for us to have to use later on, which then goes into the quantified self movement. Um, which means you can quantify that data. You can see, okay, how many data points can I get, get and how, how can I make this optimal? And collect these para parameters to self-configure them, to learn, and eventually, if we talk about the healthcare applications of this, we really look at the preventative medicine aspect of it. So moving into this constant um, loop to give us you know, longevity effects or societarian impacts or healthcare economical impacts um, later on um, in, in, in the future. And this is really where personalized implantables um, or the route they are taking at the moment. I think a lot of insight can be drawn from wearables and how we use them at the moment because they're the external fact of an implantable. So there was a study done in 2019 um, where a group in Eastern Europe asked themselves, okay, what are all the papers being released in the wearable sector and what are they actually you know, telling about, um, about the research that is being done there, the development that's being done there. And so they collected all of this data and they grouped it up into different you know, subgroups. And I'm not sure if you guys can actually um, read this, but this says monitoring, this says sensor, this says communication. Um, and it very much went towards these kind of core aspects of Sensors, monitoring, communication, security being a big one, and, and, and acceptance. So let's translate this information that this paper gave us um, and put it into implantables. What, are, what can an implantable do that a wearable cannot do? And part of it, of course, is monitoring, and part of it, of course, is censoring, because it's inside of our body, meaning it can take up our liquids and it can you know, show us what, what we are like from the inside. Um, so um, this really gives us insight about how wearables are moving very precisely towards these healthcare aspects. The other one obviously being data security and how can we keep, keep those aspects safe and implantables can play a big role in that area as well. So what is it like today? It's been done in Sweden. So in Sweden we've got a use case as we estimate about uh, 50,000 people in Sweden who have implants, they use it for their train ticketing system. So you can board a Swedish train with an implantable and hold your ticket on that, uh, on that device and then be scanned and, and that being used. Um, they have set up a micropayment system in a, in a um, big mall 
where they said, um, you, you, for, to, for these three days, you can pay with your implant for whatever you buy in this mall. And people adopted it really quickly. They said, okay, yeah, great, I'll do it. Um, the first person who ever boarded a train with an implant was also done in Sweden. So the Swedish are very advanced in those sectors and, um, and are going into great lengths. But we see implantables being used in the United States um, for predominantly authentication, so authenticating yourself to another level. Um, we see implantables being done in Japan. That's very much for healthcare. Uh, we see, you know, all sorts of industries, especially in kind of payments um, and especially in um, in other sectors such as um, such as transport. Them looking at this and saying, you know, what we need this technology because it solves a need in our in our in our market. Um, what we get a lot from kind of businesses and, and where we um, where we see a lot is that they say we need more adoption. We need people to show us that you know they can actually want this, and this is really the route that is going to slowly evolve for them to adopt the systems where we can use this in our daily life, opening our doors, um, going into cabs, paying, uh, using autonomous vehicles, and so forth. So then we ask ourselves the question, so what do people think? What do people want in Europe from implantables? And where can we go from this? And we asked 400 people in Europe, and this was relatively random, so we did you know, a Facebook ad and asked Europe in that and said, you know, could you please answer the survey um, for us? And of course, we had to mention uh, implantables themselves, and we, we had to mention our company. So um, there might be biases I'm going to discuss in a second. However, what we wanted to establish is really, what is the first reaction? The survey was not very long. It was 10 questions long. It was five minutes to take. So, um, so um, that was the data from it. We had quite a <coughs> good gender. Um, uh, um, spread across this from you know young age to old age and it was possibly more towards um, the older ages that we got a lot of um, uptake for this um, there's one you know gender bias that we had where we had 60% females and 38% males answering the survey um, but there was no particular bias in, in, in age groups per, per se now when we asked them would you get an implant we actually had quite a surprising amount of numbers saying, yes, yes, I would get an implant. And we had the expected number saying, no, I wouldn't. And it was pretty even split 50-50. <coughs> if we look at, you know, what the others said, so from the, uh, you know, what, what would people reply to that? There was about 5% of maybes, maybes, maybe I would, maybe I wouldn't, I'm not sure. There were 3% who said, I just need more information about this, I don't know anything about it. <coughs> And then there were 3% who said, yeah, I would, but it would have to have certain and certain functions for me to do that. Um, we looked at the genders, and surprisingly to us, there was no, there was no bias. It was, it was pretty 50-50 split on who said yes and no. And if we looked at the age groups and we divided it up, it was very surprising that the age group that was most likely to be willing to have an implantable was 51 and over. Um, the same, obviously, uh, the, the same was true from 31 to 40 year olds. The age group that was most against it, surprisingly, was 26 to 30, um, which is which is an in, in interesting um, drive, which was unexpected from our behalf. However, to have 50% of people telling us yes, I would get one. It's, it's a matter of like, why haven't we done this? Why, wh why are we not, you know, why are we, not, we not moving into that direction? So we also asked them, what's the most important aspect for you in a company for implants? What, what would make you decide to get an implantable from such and such co company? And 30% of people said it's data security. And I think that's quite prominent to telling us that this is the way it, it should be. And you know, building good tech and ethical tech is really important in the space like implantables especially. And any implantables company should be focusing very strongly on this. The second part was a clinical approach. Now, for the, you know, for the time being, this has been done very, in a very underground setting. So was that one part that kept people from doing it, that it wasn't readily available and it wasn't 
they weren't able to just you know go down the road and get their implant. Um, was that a factor of why it hadn't been adopted? And thirdly, it was functionality. And we know the functionality bit is somewhat due to systems around us not being ready for this. But um, it's, quite, um, it's quite interesting with functionality, is this is something that will be a long-term well, long view, but it'll also be a chicken and egg scenario until we get there. Now, when we asked them, what would you like your implant to do? So if functionality is 22% of the reason why you would choose to have an implant from a specific company, then what would, be, what would you want to use it for? And we gave, went in, and I need to be really honest with this, I went in uh, with this vision of like, people want <laughs> sensors, people want you know, vital signs. That's what people want. You know? And when we asked them, there was actually only 30% who said, yeah, I want to know, you know what my glucose levels are, what my lactate levels are, which was surprising to me because <coughs> that would have been something that I would have had a bias towards. Um, and you know, 35% for identity is actually really high. In 2014, the European Union looked at this sector and said, okay, you, you know, this is out there, this is a possibility for identity, are we going to do this in the EU or not? And they wrote a long paper, I think it was six pages long, and um, said no we're not because of ethical issues, because we can't force upon people to have implants, which is, which is, which is right by them. Um, and back in 2014, then that, that, that was earlier, but if 35% of people would want an implant for that functionality, should that be an option in the future? Um, the same goes for access, so accessing your door and accessing your car and, and going out there. That is also um, one, one of the major driving factors. Payments, of course, are 34%, which was quite expected. So there was a survey done in London in 2019, um, in the summer, and they asked 1,500 people, what do you want to pay with in the future? And 11% of people came back and said, I want to pay with an implant which is a very telling sign of where you know, the whole payment world is, world is going from that um, aspect. And of course, um, medical information. Now, this is where our slight bias was in. <coughs> By mentioning our company name, we obviously put a bias in there because um, we as Impli, um, we built an application that interfaces with an implant and holds your medical records at all times so that if you have an accident on the road, you can be found, people can scan you, people know who you are, and people know your pre-existing conditions but it can also be used just to communicate your medical history with a, with a healthcare professional, especially when you're in foreign countries. And this really brings us to um, IMPLI and you know, the initiative that we set up in London at the moment. Um, so we went into this company saying, <coughs> we want to make people's lives more convenient and safer using implantable technologies. And we looked at all the applications we could have gone into, and we chose an application that was quickly and easily adoptable and would bring immediate value to our customers. And that was in healthcare. So healthcare records that a person can put inside themselves, um, load up and kind of keep like an emergency card with them at all times, but would also record you know, your medications that you're on, many people who are on medications, it's, it's quite hard to remember all of the you know, drugs that you're being prescribed. Um, uh, and so uh, and so forth. And we launched this app in January this year. We launched our implantation <coughs> service in January this year, and we're doing this in London only at the moment to use it as a trial to see can we can can we do this? Are people interested? How much demand is there? And we do this by a very easy booking system. So you book online, um, you get an appointment, you go to your implant station, which we set up. Um, you download our application and you start using it with your implant. And I can do a, a demonstration with, with my implant. That's you. Um, so I, if you want to see it on a closer level, I'm happy to like, come around and show you. But there it just scanned my implant. It flashed up in yellow and you can see my medical information. <laughs> <laughs> there is a functionality where, where we can show you on the implant itself, um, but this is the app um, that we use and we've built at the moment. So um, that's what we're setting up um, here. So here's a quick overview of you know the, the information it stores and the interface it looks, uh, it looks like. Now the really big question is, of course, this is very valuable and very useful, but would we get like many people using implants 
just for their medical records. Like they, at the moment, we ask people, how do you keep your medical records? 30% say we keep it with our doctor. Um, so is that, is that really like the, the, the vision of, or is that enough convenience to convince people to use implants on a daily basis? or regularly. And this is really where we ask the question, what are the future applications? What does the future actually look like in this space? If we can do this today, um, what's, what's the next step after this? And I think it's important to understand what areas to look at. You can either look at kind of the smart city area, so the IoT area, so integrating yourself into the environment as a human, um, and you can look at it from the internal area, so internalized in your body what does it measure, how does it measure, where does it measure, um, and for what. And these obviously some, somewhere overlap. So um, applications in smart cities could be access to gyms. This is being done in Sweden, but for sure not in wide market, but um, access to your car. So we had conversations with um, car companies, um, so manufacturers, who said, okay, you know what, your idea is actually really important for us in autonomous vehicles because autonomous vehicles won't have keys anymore. How can they have keys? Because you know, we, we use them, we, we will use them at the same time. Um, which means that a fingerprint for a car is not an ideal situation <coughs> because it gets wet and it's difficult to read. And facial recognition might also not be a good access method for that. So that's the point where we say, okay, maybe that's a solution for implantables to use. And maybe that's a, that's a route to go down, on, um, down towards. And the same goes obviously for passports, as we mentioned already, um, accessing you know, uh, safes and so on, and the world around us. Now internally, we have different metrics. We want to measure what's our glucose level like, what's our heart rate like, what's our pressure like, and how all interact within each other to tell me more about my health status of healthcare at this point in time. So, at the moment, going very much into the healthcare vision and what healthcare looks like in the implantables world, um, we're at the medical identity state, which is, which is just over here. You know, we're at the very beginning. We're saying, okay, you can get your medical identity with you, you can carry it with you at all times. We could integrate it into systems if, if, if that was so thought. The second level out there are electronic sensors, so temperature, heart rate. So I've got a temperature sensor right here, measures my temperature. Um, and this is something that we're looking to launch. Now, what can temperature tell us? Temperature can be very valuable for um, insights on contraceptive methods so, um, or fertility rates, or it can be very interesting for cancer patients because their, you know, their immune system is depressed. So you know, what, can, what can those levels tell us? Or it can tell us um, information about you know, our general well-being as, 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 as a person. The next level after electronic sensors are really the biosensors. So can I measure your chemicals with it that sit subcutaneously? Um, and that could be glucose, glucose for diabetics, but also for prediabetes, big problem in the world. That could be lactate, um, lactate for sports people, so people under a lot of stress. That could be cortisol levels also, uh, people who have you know, high working positions, people who have, who are under very stressful situations to be able to monitor that and to be able to regulate that um, from some level. But biosensors um, can also be used to measure drug-related, um, you know, how much drugs do my, does my body take up? So people who've had valves replaced, um, heart valves replaced, um, that are on warfare, and that takes a long time to adapt that kind of medication. So can we measure with an implantable if our, uh, if our body is taking up the drug as we want it to. So it goes very much into that precision medicine um, area. And that also plays in mind with, okay, you know, what about pharmacogenomics? How does that work with the actual facts so or the phenotypic data that we get from that? Um, obviously, it then goes also into accessibility. So how, how, how does that work? For example, um, an ethanol sensor for driving a car, for preventing drink driving or um, the interaction with other devices. Does my device then suddenly interact with the um, ultrasound device that's at my doctor that can tell you even more inf information by gathering that data and doing quick um, analysis? And how does that whole um, information get processed um, in an artificial intelligence way? So how can we 
actually predict from that what will happen. Will the surgery be successful based on the metrics that we get from the internal body at that point in time? Um, and these are really exciting potential applications in healthcare in the future. And these are really measurable, um, and this can be done with um, implantables like this, but also nanobots in the future for sure, um, when we go further down the line. But I think that we have to think about um, the healthcare system as a whole. I think that um, looking at just one part, you know, how does it help the one individual human is not enough, but how can we use implantables to drive a better future for the whole system in itself? And that can obviously mean the Internet of Things in the hospital itself. So that means linking, um, linking your, your implantable to the wheelchair that you use, to the blood samples that you give, and building a system around that that securely keeps your records, but also very accurately <coughs> keeps your records. So if we think about the UK, where 20,000 people each year die of mismedication, could we save people in that way? Could we make uh, systems more efficient? Um, the second point is obviously monitoring chronic diseases. How can we monitor chronic diseases better? How can we make lives more efficient? How can we let people uh, live longer to and live better? Um, and then obviously the precision medicine applications that we spoke, um, spoke of before and the preventative medicine, medicine applications to, to alleviate strain on the healthcare system. And all of these together can give us better and faster care um, easier disease detection and then obviously better long-term disease management and automation of our administration processes around it. Um, so this is really looking at the full system out there. Now implantables are not just healthcare. Implantables can be used for other areas and I do think there's a strong movement towards that. We as a company focus on healthcare but there could be many other applications, and you could have one implant that does multiple things. And it allows us to be a better human in our electronic environment that we face right now. Um, and this is really what we do as a company and what we want to bring to the world. And so, thank you very much. Can I answer any questions? Thank you so much, Anna. So, does your healthcare records reside on this chip, or is there an identifier so that uh, people will effectively find your healthcare records online? Yes, so you can solve that problem in two ways. Um, at the moment, we've got the app linked to an identifier that allows us to store more data. Um, currently, the chips that we have um, hold a thousand bits. Um, so you can store some information on it, and I would recommend everyone to store their most important information on there, so let's say blood group or if you have you know, a long-term disease. But all the other information I would just store on, on the app where it's quite user-friendly, and as we know, every hospital has internet, and you know, unless you're in a situation where there's really no internet, then that would, you would reserve, go back to that. So in general, if somebody gets prescribed an important new drug, would they have their chip reprogrammed to include this information? Yes, so you can edit the information at all times. At the moment, it's all editable by the person that owns the device and owns the account, but in the future, we're looking to integrate that into medical systems, so that means that a doctor could upload that information directly over there so that you wouldn't make any spelling mistakes and, and otherwise um, the information would be as correct as possible. Right. Um, what kind of uh, take-up do you expect of this uh, due course? Is it going to be a slow, linear progression? Or do you expect various tipping points to come that might uh, suddenly make a whole community say, mm -hmm. you know what, uh, now I see my friends, my colleagues, my respected family members using this. It makes sense for me to go there as well. Yeah, um, it's actually a good question. Um, and, and I think it's an important one to ask looking at the progression of this. I think it will come with, with tipping points. I mean. There will be very slow adoption in the beginning simply because when we ask people, did you know about implants before you did the survey, 50% of people said, no, I had no idea. So that means that there's not even the education that this even existed, which means we have a long way to go on that front, um, let alone um, communicating what they can do with it. Um, so there will be a very, very slow beginning, and I think it will come with dragging it from the underground where it is right now to bring it to a more mainstream application. Now, 
other tipping points come in when we go into sensors. So when a, when a device can deliver more functionalities, remember 22% of people said what was really important to them was you know, functionalities around it. Um, when we bring more functionalities, there's going to be more adoption because it's going to give us more convenience or you know, more applications of it. So it's just a matter of time and going through these steps that we will get to that point. Phil? Um, say, for instance, one had an implant and I was kept ill, and uh, how would a medical team know that I had an implant? Say, a uh, paramedic. Yes, we, we of, of course get that question um, quite often because it's part of our system that's <laughs> currently still somewhat amiss. Um, and it's, very, it's a very important aspect for us. So we started in only London. So we've got lots of competitors globally and they focus on all sorts of markets. We focus on only London because we want to create that system. So we communicate with ambulance services, <coughs> with paramedics. Um, I send emails out telling them there's so and so many Londoners who have this device. Um, and we want to set this up. So we really want to do this just in London so that we can prove that the whole ecosystem actually works. Um, and it'll be a chicken and an egg scenario for quite some time before we get to kind of the mass adoption. But if we don't start somewhere, they will never pick it up from the, from, from the level, from the institution itself. Because if you go to the institutions, they have an ethical battle to fight uh, with this technology um, that the person, the individual, doesn't. Roland? Uh, if you have an impli patient with an impli implant, do you need an impli equipped doctor or do you work according to a standard that can be read by any of these devices of your competitors? Um, it can be read by, by, by any device. So if you had an implant, I think that answers your question. That's near field, no? Yes, that's yes. NFC. Um, mm -hmm. That has a unique identifier. Um, currently, that's how we work, that you can integrate it to, to the application. Yes, but you, the they need your application. There is no general kind of medical implant reading standard to which these applications yeah. conform. Cur not. Cur currently, not that we know of. Uh, okay. We're trying to set up uh, an association around this. We're trying to set up. We're trying to work with regulators. Um, we're trying to do a lot of things in that space <coughs> to get standards in place and to um, and to get get this into a, a progression because you know one of our key aspects is to keep it safe uh, and high quality, because I think this is something that is really important <coughs> in the field to make it go from you know, the underground where it is right now and make it available to human beings, um, which is very much in the medical world, uh, because it sits under your skin. Um, we're working towards it, but uh, currently there's no standard as, as we know. Obviously, there's like formats, file formats, like NDEF and so on, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but, but not a standard for implantables at the moment. Question at the back there? Okay. <laughs> so I come from the other side, I'm from the biohacking yeah. underground world you were talking about. Um, so you data that over 51 was the most likely to, to uptake this. Uh, of all of the implants I've put into people, I have never put one over the age of 50. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and all in the 26 to 31, so super surprised by that. I was wondering how many people so far over the age of 50 have you implanted into? No, no. Um, so currently we have over 50 have not implanted anyone over 51 that I know of unless they like hit their we don't don't ask them for their age at this except that if they're over 18 obviously yeah. um, but uh, but but so not that I know of um, yeah absolutely I think it has to do and this is just my analysis of the data bear in mind we got this data um, <coughs> kind of last week so um, there's a lot of thinking going on and strategizing in the company as well on, on how to interpret it um, I think the move for the over 51s is because they're more faced with you know, medical problems, generally. Um, so that could be one driving factor. The other driving factor could be um, that they're you know, less about the invasive side. So um, you know, they might be open to um, more procedures in that way. I think why they haven't gone to the underground community is because um, there, there are not so many I get it, we um, look scary, I get it. No, 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 that's not what I wanted to say. Um, <laughs> I'm aware of it. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. But, um, but they're, they're, not, they're, they're just not in that world. They might not even be informed about it. Um, so this is really why taking it from, um, from 
that community that did a really great job <coughs> of developing and promoting this and, and bringing it to a level where <coughs> the 51 year and plus might actually have access to it. And we actually speak to a lot of um, elderly care homes um, and there's big interest in there uh, for, for having implantables because of the obvious reasons. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Julia? Uh, yeah, thank you. So uh, if I understood correctly, you have more than one implant uh, currently. Uh, one is uh, for reading your uh, uh, medical information and the other one is for reading your <coughs> body temperature. So <coughs> my question is, do, do you need to scan every uh, implant separate, separately or you uh, or they can communicate and uh, convey data, their data to one centralized feed? Yeah, so we're not yet at the point of uh, in, like interaction between implants, so they're devices that don't have batteries, and I think that's really important because having a battery under your skin is quite problematic and <coughs> quite difficult. And then otherwise, how would you harvest energy to to give like a live stream of information over? So you do need a, a reader and near near field communication. So NFC um, is very much you know near, so you know you can't read it from a distance either. Right. And so you've got a one centimeter distance that you have to read it. So at the moment, yes you do have to read them individually. Um, that being said, I don't uh, I think I don't think there's an NFC temperature sensor out there at the moment. Mm -hmm. there, might, there might be in the medical device world, I'm not quite sure. Um, we're hoping to bring one out at some point, but this one, for example, and don't do this at home, um, <laughs> is, is one from the animal world. Uh, and okay. you know, I just experimented and saw, can we do this? Is this feasible? What can we do with it? And, and it gets read by RFID. So thank you. And, and also you said that, sorry, that the, when, you, one, when you're reading, uh, uh, actually your phone is sending energy to your, uh, to, to your sensor, to your uh, implant. Yes. So that's how the <coughs> NFC works. Yeah. Um, so there needs to be a device that sends energy into the semiconductor that sends, you, sends information back. So that's how there's a quick information of exchange. And that's how we don't need a, need a battery to do this. But thank but you. But the same as credit cards or Easter cards, there's no battery in there, yeah. but it receives a pulse of energy from the reader. Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tony? Yes. Uh, <coughs> I have very few, very quick, short questions. Mm -hmm. Do you have a website? How much it costs? Can I get it? <laughs> You're over 51. Yeah. Uh, You're over 51. So I would qualify. <laughs> yeah. um, are there any licensing uh, uh, problems? that you may have, are you considering it? Uh, are you outside the sphere of big implants like prosthetics, prosthetics? And the final one are about um, brain implants. Mm. Uh, I'll finish with this. Very, <laughs> very, very, exactly, very interesting I have a very long <laughs> question on that one. <laughs> yeah. um, so, yes, we do have a website. Uh, Impli.org um, is, is, is the address. Um, you can find us find us there. You can obviously find us on social media um, uh, under Impli World um, uh, and, and follow us there, please. <laughs> um, we, you know, yes, you can get one. Um, <coughs> we're, we're live. Considering regulations, so this is something that we've had many discussions about. We've had a lot of research being done. Uh, currently, they're unregulated devices. There is no regulation. We're trying to get through to regulators. We're trying to make regulations around this because it's so important for us to build regulations in the space so that we don't have, you know, another crash in this and actually manage this time around from 1998 to now to bring it onto market and actually bring the benefits mm -hmm. uh, I can to give people. you one feedback. Yes. One implant that's going to be regulated in America by yeah. FDA. This is the Neuralink Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's a bit of a different uh, device um, than what we have. So uh, personal implantables to neural links. Um, I think there's like a step, and that I guess goes to your last question. Um, I think there's a, there's a step in between, and we're kind of the step before that. Before you would get a brain implant, you're probably more likely to get an implant that helps you every day. Um, there are applications for neural links, and there are very strong applications mm -hmm. for neural links, and they have huge benefits. And I do think that um, that brain implants are, are, are a vision of the future, and will definitely get adopted, and have been adopted in many ways. And they will get there. Are, there are FDA-approved implants um, such as this, 
but they have to have a medical functional. They have to be in a medical system, which is the problem with the regulation. So in Europe, it's the MDD or soon to be MDR regulation for medical devices that says unless it's in a medical system or it senses any medical information, it's not deemed as a medical device, which is problematic for us because we say it is a medical device, technically yeah, speaking. When you see the danger <laughs> from a competitive point of view, that if they device, uh, make a device, that is implemented the brain and gets all the information, almost all the information about your body status, mm. then your implants will not be viable. So I'm just you know, looking perhaps to I three years ahead. I, I completely agree. And uh, when we talk about nanobots, it's the same. Will our implant be, be necessary if we have nanobots? Um, it's not the question about in 15 years, 20 years time. It's about what can people adopt right now? And if people don't adopt this, they're for sure not going to have a brain implant. Even I'm quite cautious when I say I'm going to, you know, um, put electrodes in my, in, into my brain, or when I say I'm going to like inject nanobots into my bloodstream. Um, it's one level above than just going underneath the skin, where well, I understand. Maybe more than one level. Maybe maybe <laughs> more than one level. Um, so I do I do agree with that. And us, you know, us as a company are looking to innovate, and that means develop in the future. Can you say something about the cost? Yes, sorry, I forgot that question <laughs> in the middle. <laughs> so um, we, we currently have a promotion on, so we sell them at uh, 80 pounds, and the retail price otherwise is 120, and then that's excluding the 80. Um, what we're trying to do with our pricing model is to make it as easy as possible for our customers to get one, um, as well as <laughs> not overpricing them, because that just builds barriers and not underpricing them. Anybody the for the insertion? No, that's this is including. Alan? <laughs> Very good. We'll come back to that. So um, I understand you're representing the technology in an aspirational manner. You're, you have something to help the world, which is great. I want to hear all that. Yeah. But at the same time, one of the uh, sort of missions of the London Futurist is to understand opportunities and risks. Yes. So I also want a, a sort of a balanced mm -hmm. expose of, of all the things that can go wrong. And um, just to give an example, I work in technology. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Bruce Schneier, one of the uh, big security gurus, um, has written extensively about the Internet of Things because there was a lot of aspiration for the Internet of Things. And he's written about how, as a, from a security perspective, it's actually quite a disaster because most devices have got no cautionary uh, you know, security, security model. Um, so that's just a request for for a, 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 a dialogue. more yeah, yeah. More, more balanced on the risks because it might it might be positive as well because if I hear more about the risks I'll be more willing to be to believe it's been assessed and not a lot of new technologies especially go wrong very easily they they, they focus only on the positives um, and specifically on the thing about who owns the information uh, whether it's how much is in the device um, I think Tim Berners Lee the guy who is credited with inventing the internet, he, he has been continuing to work on a project called Solid, okay. which is about letting individuals own their own information when they're interacting with things on the internet. Mm. And um, it's, it's morphed into a, a company called Inrupt, and, and Bruce Schneier works with him. Yeah, so it might be a good collaboration to, to look absolutely. at the security, privacy yeah. elements and who owns the information and see if you can get on top of that platform. Absolutely, no, very interesting, and I do agree with you. There's critical aspects to this, um, like there is with any technology um, there is out there. Um, and I think we need to be very, very cautious about the critical aspects. And this comes to do with applications, but data security. Um, that 30% of people say that data security is their ma major aspect of why they would choose a company actually brings it to the forefront of this. Um, but we have this problem not only in implantables, we have this problem in wearables. If you think about the Fitbit and Google acquisition and the complications you around it. Leave it behind, you can, you can decide not to be vulnerable by leaving it behind. So it's like a bit awkward when it's, yeah. you've got to dig inside yourself to get it out. Yeah, no, exactly. So um, you can remove it, which is also a good thing because you can't remove your fingerprint and you can't remove your face, or it's very difficult to do that. Um, so um, so there, there are positives and negatives of it, of course. Um, looking at the, you know, every company needs to make their own statements about this. We look to be an ethical company and, you know, data sharing should be by consent only. Um, and this should be held with encrypted data. So we're currently collaborating with a company called Circa Gene on using homomorphic encryption uh, on this data so that it is safe. 
Um, I think we can only do as a company as much as we can to you know, make sure that our devices are safe and that we bring out applications that are really ethical rather than the unethical sides. But there are unethical sides towards sensing. So are people becoming too obsessed about their, their data? Is this whole like doing steps, is that too much? How can we regulate this? Is there a point where we can say, to not obsess people, only the doctor can read out the data, or only the doctor can see the data, and the patient never sees the data, he just you know, knows that his, the doctor's looking after them. Um, so I think when we look at technologies, we just need to look at the, and I do agree, we need to look at the bad sides in terms of understanding them, and for example, things like Black Mirror did a great job at presenting the bad sides of technology, but I think we can't leave technologies behind just because there is one angle of it that's bad. There's bad things to the internet. There's bad things to all technologies. There's bad things to a knife. Um, so I think what's really important to be said is that um, let's criticize it and let's try to build good tech. Um, and, and that's kind of the, the way that we look at the company and try to bring it forward. Question there? Um, so full disclosure, I'm one of the suites mm. you talked about. Uh, <laughs> so I'm very proud of, uh, yeah. I think a lot of interesting applications that you discussed in energy you know, access control payments. Mm. On a technical level, I guess to be cynical, they're essentially reading and writing data in a passive way. Mm. It just happens to be that it's inside your body. It's not easy to steal, it's not easy to yeah, But I guess it would be interesting to hear what, what the next step is. Up 10 years from now, but what is the first active power device? I don't know, you are not the one that you're seeing. Um, from active power devices? Yes. So, um, you know, we're in conversations with a lot of groups in this space. Um, and uh, some groups are coming up with really interesting ideas, harnessing energy from the body themselves, um, ideas around that, ideas how you can use this energy to, to you know, give an active stream. Um, I think that's the most innovative that we've seen so far. Um, it's not easy to build that technology into the body. Um, it has been done before but um, we're still a long way away from commercialization. So if I talk about biosensors, I think that's within the next 10 years. If I think about active devices that send a signal out, I think that's within 20. And is there any particular application that seems to be driving to something that we need that thing for, essentially, that would get us there? It's a good question. Um, there's many applications that that could be really useful for, and we can think of many because it can send a continuous stream. Um, of, of information forwards, um, um, you know, um, I'd have to think about that more, more strongly. Do you have a comment on that point? Yeah, mine's to follow up to this. Yeah. There's been a LiPo battery implanted into the arm here. We use key charging, wireless charging for it. What it's kind of battery, sorry? LiPo, lithium polymer. Lithium polymer. It took one arm. hit and then it expanded and exploded inside his arm. It was not a pretty yeah. day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So that's the reason not to rush ahead and put bad things inside the shit. Yeah. I think the implant was about this big. It was huge. Yeah. 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 That's not the service you're offering. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 not, no not, in the, not in the near future until like that, that goes through um, some stage of development. Um, I think to that, you know, lots of people have tried this like external energy uh, charging mechanism. The problem is the skin is not like a device. That a, like even if you put your phone onto a, a wireless charger, it gets really hot, and you feel things getting really hot really quickly inside of your body. So um, that was the experience that other people had in this uh, in this relam. But I do think that there's a great space um, that will open up in 20 years' time, going for active devices. I mean, you can think of the monitoring aspects of it. Uh, go on. On the uh, current uh, NFC devices, if you get one and you find after some time that it becomes, it gets hacked, uh, other people can pretend that you are you, then you want to get rid of it and get an update. Is there a standardized way of getting rid of them? Obviously, a surgeon can cut open and dig, but is there something standardized that you go in with a needle, click into, into the implant and pull it out? Yes, so if, if you've seen um, the contraceptive implants that are out there, um, they, I've got one here, uh, I've got lots of implants. <laughs> um, you, can, you, can, you can pull them out with a, with, with a, with a hook, that's how they work, and that's mm -hmm. how they get so removed. It has a little eye, and you just have to find the eye. And yeah, and then you pull it out um, okay. to get that. So removals of, um, of implants, and you know, maybe Aiden uh, can, can, can explain more, is actually being done quite often. Um, we implant into the hand, so trying to find your implant is not too much of a problem um, in order to take it out. 
Um, the good thing is obviously you can take it out, whereas when you think about deep fakes and so on, that is like your identity on the internet, which you can't take out anymore, um, which this technology at, at least prevents. Dave, do you have a question? Yeah, I was going to say about search and rescue. Um, and I guess from what you were saying earlier, it's probably more a case of a pa an active device rather mm -hmm. than a passive one would be needed to search. If someone goes missing in the wilderness, for example, mm -hmm. uh, would that would a passive device be able to um, service that need, or do you, would you need an active or yeah. active device? So, in in my opinion, that could be a passive device that could work. If you look at avalanche sensors, so I'm, I'm, I, I ski, mm -hmm. so right, okay. um, there there are passive devices can work so if you made it into an implant roll then that would be possible so, so searching aircraft we've got to pick up a signal by by sending a signal and then listening to, for a, an echo back um, yes it, it would work, work like the um, reco reco devices that Avalon just worked that could work I'd have to think about further how that would work mm. or what different technologies there are mm -hmm. um, there are also different frequencies you can use I mean near, near field frequency is not the only implantable device there are there are RFID devices that have a longer frequency range, there are UF, U, UHF devices that have a longer uh, frequency range that could be re read from further away. Um, it would just be a matter of you know, seeing what are the ranges that you're looking for and you know, more details around that. Um, right. But I think for search and rescue, could be a good application in the military, could be a good application in, uh, you know, um, uh, in regions that you can't reach so easily. Mm. Um, definitely. Did you have a question? Okay. Yeah, I'm kind of curious about the um, Devices themselves, and you're not manufacturing the implant, source the implant yeah. from a third party. So, in the sphere of people who are manufacturing these devices, is there a, a trend towards making um, uh, uh, larger storage in them or to uh, making them a more customizable device? Because uh, you said that it's 1K yeah. device, which, you know, many of us go, oh, God, that's, that's uh, 1980s technology, what are we doing? But, is, is it going to be that if we look five years ahead from now, people need to be able to store 10,000 MP3s in their thumb? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, so we do see trends. We see trends in mini mini miniaturization, so making smaller devices and making devices smaller, um, which also means making devices more powerful. Um, I think the earlier devices were not as powerful as these ones, and they're kind of continuing to develop that. Um, uh, we are trying to do that too in some <coughs> respect because obviously holding your information directly on your chip is better than on an application. Um, so miniaturization is definitely a trend um, and it's definitely going forward in that area. The other area for hardware is in the sensing world, so building sensors um, or building other functionalities around it. So there's different tag types of NFC, I mean, NFC chips that work with different functionalities. So. Um, is there a follow-up question to that? Is, is there much competition in that space, or is it uh, only a fairly small number of companies? Um, it's a fairly small number of companies if we consider like other industries. Um, it's, it's, it's actually a tiny, tiny industry. There's, there's, a couple of manufacturer, there's a couple of manufacturers in America, um, there's a couple in Sweden, um, there's factories in, 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 in China that produce them, that have experience with, with this kind of implantable. So, um, in the grand scheme of things, uh, it's it's a very small amount <laughs> of companies who do this at the moment, and it's a very specialised uh, um, kind of skill to have. Cool. Phil, I have a question about marketing. You talked about a, a reaching a tipping point and, and well, trending tra trend in news, but in a different context. The thing that brought this up in my mind was a friend of mine many many years ago put himself pair of 18 karat gold collar stickers. So these were very high prestige items from Asprey's and they went into his collar in his shirt and nobody saw them. Only he knew that he had this mm. prestigious item. And it occurs, it occurs to me that wearables are things that people show that they can be trained. So there's a, a taxi driver who was raving about New Apple Watch that would read his heart rate, heart rate and things like that. Um, but these are hidden. It isn't something that you can show off about. And I'm just wondering whether there might be some way of of having it so that you, you know, some sort of special tattoo on your hand. Or, 
Some people have this. Yeah. You could sell a T-shirt with it, couldn't you? We, we do. How's <laughs> this prestigious? Latest trendy thing. One of those buttons is that you know the baby on board while he's like. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 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 yes. No, to, to answer your question, I think that interface is going to be really important. But if you look at the whole op optimization component, Swoosh is a company which doesn't have a visual component; it's just a band on your wrist, and basically has real-time monitoring into a system or a platform. And I think that's where wearables and implantable become. Sort of merging together. Right. So I think you will have that look, but as we go further down the line, think of insurance companies, think of how we are um, pushing and driving for that information to be used in a commercial sense, is when, do you care about it being shown, or do you care about the fact that you get 50% off your life insurance because you wear a device? So I think you've got closed loop systems which become really interesting, then you've got the B2C component where it's directly to market, where you're <coughs> talking about health optimization, talking about real life, or people just want to know more. And I think we're moving away. I think Apple will be a reader of this device in the future. So I think you would use oh, those wearables as a reader no, 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 because no. your ecosystem becomes important and connecting to the, the wider ecosystem. So that's just my opinion. Um, yeah, so I mean, we, I, I think like the marketing aspect of this is a really crucial and important part of it, and that's a really crucial and important part of, kind of our company because we have to, you know, we have to let people know that there is a good side of this and you know that there is useful a applications out there and I think it comes with the applications and the functionality um, that this becomes um, this becomes popular um, we did try to solve that problem or actually our collaborators um, uh, did try to solve that problem um, uh, with with an LED so um, if you if you were down here you could see it um, I can show you later so when you scan it there's an LED that flashes up uh, and the LED comes in different colors so people can choose colors. So for example, at the moment, we've got very rare orange ones. Uh, we only have 20 orange ones. So whoever has an orange one is for sure one of the early adopters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, well, making visible the number of people, in some sense, the number of people who've already adopted them is, is an interesting question. What surprised me from your opening remarks was the number of people in Sweden who already have these, because if you'd asked me, I'd have said maybe in the hundreds, but yeah. I think you said... No, it's a lot more. They've been doing it for a long time. Yes. I think that's important. Like, I think uh, 2012 or 2014 they started. Yes. I'm not quite sure when they started with this, um, but, but quite, a, quite a long time ago. So they've been doing it for, yeah. for years already. So, and they had, a, they had a big use case. I mean, if, if someone would tell me, you can you put your Oyster card into your implant, I would be like, yeah, for sure, because I lose my Oyster card all the time. Um, Alan? Um, so we've heard about sen um, sensor-based implants, where it's basically read-only, the you know, information comes out of the body. But um, I think I remember Kevin Warwick's, he did an experiment with his, his wife had a sensor, and they had a, he, could, he could think a thought, and she could feel it, or vice versa. So there was active mm. response in the body. Mm. So have you got any uh, information about the opportunities for those things? Are you, are you involved or interested in, in those things as well? Mm. When there's some state change in the body as a result of the implant Yeah, so very interested in it, not involved in it at the moment, um, just because we're, we're uh, we do have a research angle of, of the company, but we're looking very much at trying to commercialize just the, the, the base of it, rather than going into very advanced figures, which also goes into new, uh, uh, neural pathways and neural um, uh, implants. Um, I think there is use for it. So there are many people who think, so if you know, for example, Body Data Space in London, um, they talk about the vision of communication with implants. So can they identify hands and gestures and how can they interact with our communicating world around us? And I think it's really important to think about the other use cases. I mean, I really touched on healthcare, but um, it's a technology um, and technologies can be used for, um, for, for very many things. And yes, Karen Warwick did um, go into that kind of research where he you know, could control, I think it was heat or, or light um, underneath his skin. And if we look at what very early adopter biohackers and gonna, or the cyborgs do at the moment, they also very much go into the, uh, into the feeling and sensing part of it. So if you've heard about a company called North East, North I think. Star. North Star, sorry, yes, thank you. Um, North Star, they very much go into the sensing part um, of things so that you can feel things so they can tell where North is at every point. Um, so I think there are companies out there that do that. There are people out there that look for this kind of information. 
The heads up on the nose guard technically not implantable. It just sits on two ears. You it doesn't actually go inside your body. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I would. Really I would have classified that. Yeah, I would have classified that as it's a high as rejection rate. Incredibly high rejection. Rate. <coughs> you get about a ten percent success rate. <coughs> really? Yeah, they're quite invasive. Um, yeah, the North Star's pretty much gone. Yeah. They're no longer really around. They didn't do too well. Really? Yeah. They um. Yeah. So they, they all came out two years ago or something. Yeah. Like they they they, they had a bit of a buzz for a while, yeah. but then they kind of went. They because as, as many people were saying about the rejection rate and a couple of other st stuff that was going on the way that they were actually kind of like bolted onto the skin. There was those problems. With yeah, they uh, were also quite big. They were like devices. Yeah, like they were huge. The stuff in the chest. So yeah. I, was, uh, I see. I've, I've known people that have had them and yeah. not had them anymore. So yeah, yeah I mean, the, the safer side of the stuff that you guys are doing is it's so small and the, the chance of rejection is really not that high at all. It's a massively different approach to doing something that's actively powered or something that's that large. So. Yeah, so actively powered and they you know, those are really tricky questions to answer. Um, that's why we're not doing them. But um, there are companies, so there are people out there who like try to measure electromagnetic waves to you know, feel certain things. So that's some people in Barcelona are working in that space. Um, so there are other applications, just not that commercially available. Yeah, I was thinking we've talked quite a lot about the physical health, um, you know, the area where this can be applied. Uh, but the very you know day and age, uh, very topical of mental health as well and we touched upon medication and I'm thinking of, of the vast you know amount of people taking antidepressives and anxiety and things like that um, which also kind of touched on whether whether this one can sense whether these medications work you know and one can tell a doctor I'm feeling better by taking this medication but I'm wondering if there's actually any way that it can be proven that it does indeed work or is that too alien is it only a person that can say I'm actually happy or is there a way that the, that the device yeah. can actually sense whether that particular antidepressive works I but think it, yeah does I think that I th make sense I think for clinical trial because companies it's, health yeah. issues is just such a topic Abs you know absolutely today. for clinical trial companies it will be really um, revealing how much is actually a placebo effect um, of the drugs that we take um, and I mean if you know the study with the horse uh, with the two horses that got the same medicine and they suddenly both got better so it's not just a human thing it's also an animal um, mm. thing the placebo effect but um, uh, but yes so that would be one of the applications in the future um, so you could think about doing that with biosensors um, it would just take time to develop and you'd have to you know prove and you'd have to see if, if that's possible how it's possible with nanobots possibly much more likely in three weeks' time, in uh, London Futurist, we have a talk by Martin Dino uh, about some of the techniques that his company is investigating to provide more reliable feedback about you, people's mental states. Mm -hmm. Because notoriously, we're often bad at our assessing our own mental states, just as we often like to think, hey, we're above average drivers, <laughs> uh, and many people in a similar thing are not aware of quite uh, the fluctuations of our own mental state. Sometimes people over rate over exaggerate and sometimes people under exaggerate. So that's one way to uh, explore this topic further. You had a point on this as well? Just a question. I mean, uh, just from Louis as well, are you trying to say that you can depict mental health or are you saying you don't want to read the underlying markers which could depict the, um, the effectiveness of medication? So if you take yeah. medication, they can read medication levels. If you take uh, mental health, is it the cortisol levels inside your body that you're trying to read? What are the fundamental markers that you're trying to read which indicate that you're in a healthy state? Because I think we should differentiate between a physical healthy body and someone who's suffering from an underlying mental health issue, and whether it's a chemi chemically based one or whether there are other issues that need to be dealt with. So, so, so my what brain was kind of, you know, just, you know, as my thought process went, went around, you know, having, you know, colleagues and friends that, that are suffering from mental health have tried several different medications yeah. and it takes a long time till they find something that actually sort of works. Yes. Yeah. Side effects, etc. because it all has to do with your, you know, <coughs> age, uh, lifestyle, you know, all of it. Uh, so I, I think it was more from a perspective of could, could, um, could this device sort of actually indicate what would work better for that person? I think right precision away? medicine is, I think, precision medication would be more of an appropriate yeah. component because it would read and be able to say this is working so if it's not being taken up and it's not showing in the bloodstream it's but because of this and how it's been that's the complexity of it yeah. is it the person that says hey i'm happy or is it the device saying actually it's you know because that's kind of the border of 
you know, how much can a technology, you know, sense what, what our feelings rather than yeah. showing physically. The, do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Saying that you're sad, there's no measurement to that. Like, how long is a stage? Well, you know, we have hormones um, that we yeah. could measure along that rate. Thinking from like purely scientific perspective, um, as in, you know, the, the, there could be ways of in the future maybe developing things that could sense sadness or unhappiness or lack of energy or depression. Um, and at the same time, there could possibly be the flip side to dis discovering drugs or seeing how much, how effective are they? Tony, thanks for being very patient. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, for a young star, you seem to be a very pessimistic company. <laughs> about exponentiality of change. You said 20 years. I wouldn't give it even five years. For, for implant uh, technology to, to really progress fundamentally. You mentioned nanobots. There are already trials with nanobots. And Neuralink is releasing its first implant mid this year, if they get the FDA approved. It would be a shock. It's an absolute shock in as it could be. Now, Absolutely. In that area, because if it, it's miles uh, 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 ahead of anything that was dreamt in the market just two yeah. years ago. Yeah. So I think you have to be prepared for absolute revolution. I, th I think we have to differentiate somewhat between personal devices and medical devices. And I think mm, that's yes. like one part, because the medical industry is actually quite far in implantables if you think about it in that way, um, and, and for medical but purposes. Would you think that there would be a, a kind of a, a converge, convergence of medical and uh, say devices that identify you, uh, the devices that extend your abilities, so it all may happen at the same time. And my uh, uh, one additional question is, do you have an application for your implant? Yes, you can download it. It's uh, uh, so it, in, it, it, limited. What, what does it do exactly? It keeps your, it keeps <coughs> your medical information. So it was the application that we sh showed here with the yeah. three screens. Um, uh, you can put your medical information in there and okay, you know link it to your NHS device. Number. Your NHS number, your you know, you, if you have pre-existing medical conditions that are very important, if you're on certain one, medications. One of um, so that's directly on the chip, but we link to a ah, unique to identifier app, okay. that links to the app. Um, so, so it's it's a bit obviously the long-term vision of that would be integrating into hospital systems. So, a patient comes in, they just have to scan them, it immediately goes in, which reduces error for a hospital system, which reduces things like twenty thousand uh, missed medications. Um, in the world, because the doctor couldn't write the the uh, drug properly. Um, so there are, I, I think, to the to the to the thought of like five years or ten years or twenty years. Mm, I think there's a differentiation between yes, in five years' time, the the technology will be there to be able to do this reliably and in people, but will it be mass adoption? Um, is, is, I agree. Yeah, I'm talking about the the difference. Years. Yeah. As I think the major problem. Much more important technologically, it will be a legal. How do you legalize that? Absolutely. And pr protect the, the person's identity. So that's, uh, I mean, the, the, comp uh, uh, the complexity of it uh, is, is just enormous. Absolutely. Because if somebody hacks to your body, essentially, in a few years' time, manipulate, yeah. Yeah. do things that you don't want to. Exactly. And it starts at the very beginning. I mean, when we had like, our first sit downs with our lawyers, um, we started with like our privacy policy of our website, you know. Just think positive. And yeah, <laughs> and uh, very very positive um, towards uh, to, towards what we're trying to do and towards the future for this because I do think that we will find a solution to 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 work around it. But um, you, when we sat down with our lawyers and we sat down our privacy policy, so they were like, so what do you do? Like third factor authentication or what? What are you? And we were kind of like. Well, we're, we're not part of the body, we're a different device, but we're inside the body, so technically we are the body. So it, it threw up so many legal challenges, um, and that is for sure one of the areas that's going to grow very, very strongly. And we've seen it with the tech industry, completely unregulated, to now something that's becoming very, very regulated with looking at social media and so on. Um, and it needs to be, because we need to protect people. So predicting the future is very hard, of course. So if I go back 10 years, or maybe 2011, I remember I made many talks in 2011, 
forecasting a rapid uptake of wearables, that the Google Glass was just around the corner, and uh, <laughs> I thought in five years' time, everybody in the London Futurist meeting would be wearing a Google Glass, and that hasn't happened. But on the other hand, other things went faster than I expected. In particular, there were more breakthroughs in AI and deep learning than in my, my talks in 2011 didn't have anything about deep learning hardly, because it was very much a minority interest, and occasionally I might have mentioned it. So it all depends on how fast progress can be made on hard, difficult problems. And sometimes we, people get a nice breakthrough and it suddenly works. Other times there are these complications, the rejections from the body, the mechanisms don't work, there's a few bad cases. Uh, even gene therapy it was held back because of a very sad case of a youngster called Jesse Gelsinger about 1999, which uh, suddenly he, got, he died is the, uh, what was meant to be a routine operation that held it back. So. I'm with you, it's hard to know, but I think you have to plan for multiple scenarios. You have to be ready to move faster, but Black Swan events, also you're ready to go step by step. So I, I like what you're doing, you're mapping out a credible future and building up an ecosystem, and you go as fast as appropriate and be ready to go faster. You had a question as well? Yeah, very practical one, maybe a selfish, um, also a bit kind of, yeah. uh, if I've got a new one from you guys tomorrow, and I could go and For, for, the, for the time being, yes, we, they're open, so you could program to it what, what you would want. We would be interested in what you did do, though, um, just out of no, interest yes. from our side. <laughs> so, um, I guess that's a thought about, though, if I were, you know, sent me away from the land, could I rewrite your information to be whatever I wanted it to be? Just going to say, so in terms of an attack vector, um, you wouldn't be able to rewrite it what's on the chip, in that sense. So the way that in these web services work is it uses the ID that hard built into the tag as a method of authentication. It's effectively like a password with a few ID. So if you were close up to someone, you could read if they stored plain text information on it, which is at risk, but there are secure ways of doing it, then you could, if at uh, that moment, read that data. But if you were then trying to access the web services, you can hit the barriers of the security of their web services. So while you could get one of their implants, you'd have to build your own app and then your own web services in the back end of it anyway. So to steal someone's health information, you'd have to, one, be near their implant, then you'd have to go around with the security implications of how Impli's web services work. So it's not as straightforward as going up there and reading it or going up there and cloning it and then you've got instant access. There's, there's a few more steps to that. Yeah. But um, to be very cynical about it, I could put an old and say no resuscitation, make uh, top case bold text, mm -hmm. and that's what shows up. No resuscitation. So you can kill somebody, effectively. <laughs> You can. You if if you were concerned about this uh, threat, I mean, if someone comes a centimeter onto your skin and like touches you with their phone and you don't notice it, that is a risk. But risk, you know, most times you would. If you are scared of that, you can lock the chip onto writing so that no one would be able to write to it except yourself. So there are measures out there. It just, you know, at the moment, if you would purchase a chip, it would be open for you to program onto, and then it would be. You know, you having to program or you having to format the chip in the way that you would want it to, and we could give advice for that. But um, but you could see measures like that where you can format it where no one can write to it. But what this question brings to mind is discussions uh, of uh, various incidents. People somehow able to get money out of pay-as-you-go cards. You know, you can tap and pay up to thirty pounds at a time. If if somebody can get close enough to your credit cards, in some cases it seems they might be able to extract up to thirty pounds at a time from it by clever hacking. And then there's all the hacking of uh, car keys. You know, now you open your car by That's sending okay. a signal. Other people apparently can sometimes intercept that signal. They can store it, and then when you're not around, they can open your car. This is what I'm told. So uh, absolutely, which is why data security in this space is something absolutely yeah. vital. Um, and if, if you kind of, um, if you look at NFC devices on cards, they have a longer read space, so you can read them up to 30 centimeters under the skin. Is a bit different. Um, but um, obviously UHF devices, if we ever had them implanted, then what would happen? It would be a, a place to put secure measures in, on, in place. And there are technologies out there to protect mm. these kinds of functionalities. And I think we should act on them um, if we have businesses in that space. A, a, a quick follow-up on those. So you mentioned two different types of attacks. One was uh, for the cars, it's actually called a relay attack. So 
as the issue with actively powered devices, not passive, they're constantly giving that signal. So they would use a, basically a massive antenna, they'll walk up to someone's house, they would pick up the tiny signal of someone's key, which would be left in the doorway. It would relay that to a smaller responder, basically by the car. So the car is all it's aware is it's basically receiving the car fog signal, thinking that the car key is near, but actually it's a several different distance away. That's one of the issues of actively powered devices. But there's no there's no second factor of authentication between those two. It's that's the car signal over the door. Now, when this happened and that uh, the attack methods for that got launched, Tesla released an update to their cars um, to where you'd have to enter a PIN code before you could start the engine. Now, Tesla are one of the only companies to do that, but that is a second form of second factor authentication that stops that attack happening. And they were quick to fix that as well because it was their Tesla car that was used in the attack process. So the, the, the second issue with the uh, credit card contacts payments is what we know, a process called EMB payments. And it's a method of authentication between the credit card and the readers. Now, the only way it's not really exploited into the world as much as it is known in specific attack scenarios, but if you walked out with a contactless payment terminal, you could tap someone's phone or wallet. But it falls down to the insurance and the liability of the banks and how they would manage that, and that's where the real security of that supplies. The issue with contactless payments on the cards, they cap them at £30 for that specific reason. Apple Pay and Android Pay do not have a cap because you have to unlock your phone before you can actually then perform a contactless payment. That's why you can smash a grand or two grand on the contactless uh, on Apple Pay, and it, they won't care, that's fine. But contactless cards are capped for that reason, it's a macro effect. So, in terms of the attacks for any implants, I, mean, I actually work in the security sector, it's kind of what I do, right? So, the the attack methods on them are all around. I've had a conversation with you about this, about methods to protect in a similar way to a, a contactless credit card and how the data is encrypted and there's mutual authentication and there's a whole process for that. There are specific chips and there are platforms to provide that secure authentication to stop people being able to do that, like a contactless card, um, and unless under very specific cases where someone stole a, a point of sales terminal or something like that. But it's yeah, the, 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 there are a lot of security stuff out there. Um, which works to secure the implants and how they're authenticated against them and how the data is made of them, instead of just leaving stuff in plain text on them. So, yeah, there's some interesting developments out there already, and I'm sure A and P are already aware of uh, implementing those. So this is all right if Inplay and other companies uh, keep up to date with good security practice. Yeah. As you know, the problem with many IoT devices is that many of them have got uh, very cheap software in them, there's a race to the bottom to produce these devices as cheaply as possible and many devices bought from overseas don't have very solid security in them. So are you foreseeing a future in which uh, everybody who gets an implant is aware of these things and they, they don't just buy, they don't just implant with uh, the cheapest solution that happens to be bought from Amazon? So it's an interesting one. So the, the issue with the IoT and the difference between IoT and what should be separated from implants is because IoT is, is, is internet of things. These are not connected to the internet unless there's a phone by them and a specific application for that. So there are a whole load of range of different implants out there. Some have security features and, and some don't. So. Yeah, it's an interesting one, but there are definitely implants that have been made specifically for security purposes, and they perform against ISO standards to make sure that they work in a way that's safe and secure. So, yes, China, uh, loads of brands, they will dish stuff out without doing proper pen testing, and I've, I've mentioned about pen testing before, it's a very important thing to do, especially against the web services. Um, it's what we do as a day-to-day, -day. so as long as companies uh, keep their end at the core and they design their stuff as a secure point of view and they keep and maintain that, Yes, you'll be more than fine with this stuff, but there, there's so much security features out there and technology uh, and processes that can be put into place to properly secure this. I think what I would add to this is, of course, of, of course this will happen. Like with every industry that we saw happen, you know, peop the, the minute it becomes mainstream, you know, there's lots of competition and then there's a, there's a lowering of standards. It's a race to the market um, and <coughs> people will say, but well, we intend to test it, but you know, we're in a hurry, so we'll release it and test it later. The point is with something like this, we need to put regulations in there. And I think regulating the devices to some degree is really necessary in this space. And this is really why we're working towards that, so that this exactly doesn't happen and we don't suddenly have bad devices. And when you board. say we're working, you mean you and other Groups in our, this our, our whole Impli team. Whole Impli um, team. Yeah, <laughs> whole Impli team is working towards but, it. But I mean, don't um, you have to cooperate with other uh, companies in this as yeah. well? So it's the reason why we're setting up an association. It's the reason why we're, you know, working working closely with other companies in this space. It's the reason why, um, you know, we're talking to the MHRA. It's the reason, you know, of course we. MHRA. Uh, the, the the medical device uh, regulatory body. Okay. Alan, on this. So. Um, 
this is absolutely fascinating, and it, and it brings up uh, not just the security thing, but who's to blame when something goes wrong. And so you already mentioned when something's inside you, uh, you know, who owns it now? Um, and so the legal aspects, and I think this is all part of the picture, but there's also, with the security thing, with awareness, there's practices that people have to take responsibility for. So with your card in your pocket, there's something you could skim. You can get a wallet that sandwiches your card, so it, it, it can't be skimmed when it's in the wallet. Um, so, but um, I heard, uh, it, as devices get more, more advanced, they can start having functionality in them, like firmware. And some existing devices, like um, pacemakers, already have firmware. And they have remote, many of them have remote update features. And there was a discussion in um, Spark on the radio show in Canada uh, where the software developer who has a pacemaker and knows that it can be remotely up updated was arguing for legal access to the software of her pacemaker so that she could satisfy herself as a security expert that she wasn't, as, she wasn't more vulnerable than she was willing to be. Uh, so there's some, there's some fascinating stuff but it's all about awareness and um, privacy access, safety, mitigation. I, I, yeah, I mean of course. And, and that's what I kind of meant, you know, we're, we're going to go into a future where these things will come up and we as a population will have to deal with it as, um, as, as they come up and we'll have to prevent as much as we can um, and kind of legislate towards the human and towards making sure that safety comes first. And on this point? Yeah, yeah I also think there's also a point where you could draw a line in sand and say, like you said, is that people need to stop trying to shift accountability and become responsible for their own lives. They, they start going on to going onto the internet, putting the information out there. They don't come back later saying, I didn't put that, I didn't expect that. It's you want the benefit of the system, but you're not willing to play the game inside the system. So there's also going to be a point where someone says, I would be accountable for me. And I think we're getting to the stage where Google's the Facebooks. They're starting to draw the line saying, fine, you now opt in and consent. Therefore, you, you are to a certain degree limiting your own right by your own choice because you're giving that consent to do it. But you've got to be accountable at some point. And I think shifting the blame at the moment is what's happening. To, we've got to be honest and say, take accountability. Companies like the big guys, Google, Facebook, also need to be accountable for it. And I think that system's going to be, with regulations, going to be more defined. And I think that's an interesting space over the next 10 years. And again? Okay. Well, just to tie up a few points into one. One is about the acceleration of where the implants have come from. One in my hand is currently five years old. There's now an extra 400 bytes of data since it's in your model. Um, there's two sectors on the chip, the secure and unsecure. So the secure side I can't change, the unsecure currently has a link to a cat video on YouTube. <laughs> and the other one, so that's how you can show off, which yeah. I was thinking about. And the other one that you didn't mention is I actually stole my business card on here. So I just tap people's phones and it adds my company information to their phone. That's a new way to show off. I just thought it was a good goal. So we can try that later. Uh, it's the cat video right now, but <laughs> <laughs> I was showing my apprentice, so I was messing around. <laughs> and Phil? Regarding the security of people's confidence, it doesn't occur to me that it's not really very long ago that people wouldn't buy things online. Mm -hmm. They just wouldn't help I mean, it's a few short years. Um, retail sales are just massive. because people have stopped the companies. Well, 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 the various things the government did as well, wasn't it? They said in some cases we will recompense you. In the credit cards, companies also agreed that if uh, the people's credit card details were used uh, against their, uh, they would be reimbursed to a certain extent. So people got more confidence to use it in that case. So I think it was industry action, backed up by legislation, encouraged people to do it, and now we are much more comfortable buying things online. But it did change uh, quickly. For many people, said no, no, no. I can't imagine doing this at all. And people are uh, buying incredibly expensive things online now. But people bank online as well. But people get your medication from, from online doctors without even seeing yeah. you on face to face. So. Amazon was a bookstore, I'm just saying. Just that's how far we've come in this short space. Yeah, but it's also like from wearables to now. I mean, 2009. Yeah. That was really not very long ago. Anybody else want to raise a point that hasn't? spoken in the conversation here? Yeah, one, one quick point. Um, I was wondering if uh, there's a bit of that potential application for people who work in extreme environments, astronauts, deep sea divers, sports people. And that, that might make quite a nice way of uh, publicising the company. Have you, have you made any approaches yeah. in those areas? We thought a lot, a lot about kind of, you know, uh, people who are in a lot of stress. Um, and there has been research 
out been done out there for um, people in the medical field um, in the special forces you know you know going to the Arctic and and, and wanting and needing to sound, like measure their vitals and their lactate levels to optimize their levels out there but also I've been approached by quite a lot of you know triathletes or very high performing sports people who are trying to push for more information and if you know for example the glucose sensors with the micro needles that are out there that you stick on you know they're all using that um, but they would obviously much rather have an implantable device um, so there is a very nice niche in that in that space and when you know when I showed that loop about preventative med medicine and kind of body optimization I think that falls very much into that niche and which is a niche at the moment but but could become um, mainstream in order to prevent a healthcare service to, to be overloaded. Mm -hmm. And the military might be interested as well, yeah. do you see that? Absolutely, <coughs> uh, abs and, and they're using some of the, the applications already, um, so um, the military has big interest in this, of course. Okay. Well, I have a couple of questions I've been waiting to feed into the conversation. Yeah. One is on the international uh, landscape. Today it seems that Sweden is the country which is the, the biggest adoption of these devices, both in terms of numbers and maybe use cases. What would you imagine might be the case in five or ten years' time? Do you see, I know, I mean, your survey didn't look at this, it just looked at Europe, but mm. if there was a survey uh, around the whole world and uh, if you project what might happen, do you yes. think that it's going to be here in London that we're going to have the biggest update or, or somewhere else in the world that's going to... Asia is quite strong. Uh, Asia we, is quite strong? We don't, we don't go into Asia, but the Asians are definitely looking into it. And um, if you look at the, the Asians as, as, as people and their history, um, their privacy is not the same as Europeans, um, looking at their, you know, um, how they grew up and, 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 the, and the government, the government's involvement into their life. If we look at their tax system that's based on, you know, facial recognition and so on, they're already very far ahead of that. Um, they're also very innovative in, in, in electronics, so I, I do believe that Asia is a, is a place that's going to spark up quickly in this. Um, in the U.S. it's being done, it's being done already, I mean, people are using this in the U.S., there are companies out there doing this, there's a big interest. Um, it would be interesting, and, and I'm hoping to, to launch some market research over there to understand a little bit more about how that market works and see if there's any possibilities there and see um, if, if there might be applications there that might be very interesting, simply because the healthcare system in America um, is pushing towards preventative healthcare um, because, of, because of the way the government regulates this. And as you mentioned, insurance companies might help tip things along. Insurance companies might say, well, if you have this implantable, uh, we're going to reduce uh, <coughs> your... Could be. I mean, we've seen in the wearables. It's nothing new to us. We've yeah. seen it like uh, uh, in, in, in that space. We've seen it with our phones. It's already connected. We've seen it with uh, genomic data, if we look at that and 23andMe and what they've mm -hmm. been kind of doing. Um, it could be a version of the future, and it's probably a very, very likely one um, uh, in order to assess risks. Um, so just to, to add to that, uh, an actual bank, Sparta Bank over in uh, Berlin, so uh, they offered to give an implant with their, with their home insurance. Yeah. Offered to give people an implant <laughs> with their home insurance. Yeah, to work to work with NSC locks on their doors. Yeah. And that was this year. Oh, well, that was recent months. I say this year. Yeah. So they put uh, locks on the doors that only can only be opened by people. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, you would, you would use your hands to unlock the door and allow them into the building, and that'd be provided free as part of the, the, the bank's insurance, which is one of the uh, bigger things that happened to, for that. Yeah. Yeah. What the take up of that has been? Uh, no, that's mainly done by our German lot over there. That's yeah. not directly with us. So. It's yeah. It was quite interesting. Also, I'm German. Uh, oh yes. Heritage. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I kind of followed that story a little bit and read, read, yeah. read a little bit up on that. It's quite interesting. They only launched it in Berlin. Um, so they were very targeted about their audience that they that they did this with, and it did have some up uptake. I mean, it's 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 a bit of a trend in Germany at the moment as well, um, going over there, which was surprising for me as a German because normally they're you know quite critical, um, but in this field they're actually quite uh, <coughs> quite far along. Well, Berlin's a very special city, isn't it? Yeah, Berlin. Berlin is a special city. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say the black boxes in cars, it's also the same thing for insurance. Install this in your car, it's 50% off your insurance. Because they can simulate your car. Yeah. yeah. At first, people thought, I don't want these black boxes in my car, they'll know where I'm driving. I still don't have but one in my car. It's <laughs> <laughs> more to know how fast I'm driving, that scares me <laughs> rather than where. So, so Vitality is a very good example. Vitality? Vitality, so Discovery, which is a South African based company, created Vitality, which basically incentivizes benefits. So they sell the insurance, car, whatever it may be, 
and they loop it back through a program like Vitality, so they give you discounts on different aspects. So then they said, actually, going to a movie once a month meant that you were going to live longer, therefore they gave you access to cheaper movies, and, and they've developed that process, and now they've gone to China and the UK, and they've done a significant advancement, and Adrian Gore, who's the CEO there, has focused on saying the next stage, just we just the next evolution of what they're doing now, effectively because they can get more accurate data with closer reading points, so bias sensors. I think that's where it's leading to. So it's an interesting space. Based on what, I mean, I've got a question for the audience now. Based on what you've heard, is there anybody who says, there's no way I'm ever going to have an implant? It's like a biased question. How should I rephrase maybe that? Maybe how many people have an implant already? The people coming to this talk. Well, I guess yeah. there, there might be instances. Right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so if the people hadn't been here, what what are the strongest arguments people would still give against implanting ever? Implanting. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I still don't really know enough about the physical uh, experience and also the consequences. Like, do I have to be wary of MRI scans? You know, do have, does everything have to be taken out or will something just get ripped out of my body accidentally? Because, I, 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 you know, I'm not aware of the consequences of adopting something. It's like a new thing, so you've got to get your head around it. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I, I can read. And, and how painful would it be? You know, it's like, <laughs> can you compare it to something else yeah, that's already hard. painful? Yeah. 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 It was no more than a slight, so obviously in the insertion with the needle, it feels like something's going through your skin. And it was a relatively quick process, less than five minutes. Uh, it's clean and there's a slight dull ache for about 20 minutes, yeah. but I've now got full functionality in my hand. I haven't got the loss of grip or anything like that. And you'll see some slight swelling and the bleeding stop. And that was less than three hours ago. Yeah. Will it turn your tackle from the airport? I've taken many, many flights. Is it metal in it? Is it magnetic? Is it magnetized copper inside a bioplastic? Copper. So could he that if there was a if there was a field that was changing, for example, it could because of induction. Like so um, it, it was just a science sort. Yeah, no, and, 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 and many people ask that question you know. about MRIs and you know, it, is it compatible? Yeah. Um, it's compatible with an MRI. Um, it you know, you'll sh for sure be able to see it in the MRI. Um, but uh, but but it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't kind of Bring your hand up to the to the <laughs> magnet <laughs> or any other situation that you can imagine. So in like induction charges, like so, you know, in, in mm -hmm. Starbucks, you can put your phone on, on yeah. a plate and charge up your phone. If you if you put a um, s something that's conductive in between there, uh, it's possible that you get induced current that then heats up the material. So that's you know I wouldn't. Yeah. You know, I'm not an expert in in the consequences but of implants. Yeah. So I'd like to understand what the consequences. Um, not, not that we've seen. I mean, I have a have a charger that is inductive, and I have put my hand on it many times. But not maybe. Like yeah, it might be that it's ruled out by resonance. It can't, yeah, you know, can't do damage. Yeah, that, that doesn't. Yeah. Exactly. You need, you need to tune it. Human sensor design, which you're making, and then I watch it. I think of any uh, medication I'm taking, you actually look at the possible side effects. You know, those that I just totally. I look at and I'm aware of and I'm a rational person but I think but potentially I'm going to benefit from this rather than suffer the detrimental consequences of a reaction and there's so much what we're talking about I think it is you know eventually the incentive for people to do this will just tip but, and, and my own personal experience those people want to say they need to have a body kitten for Christmas you know cat for about 20 years it had to have a chip put in it yeah. And for me, it was a no-brainer. And now that the cat has a chip in it, I'm sort of thinking, I've got two kids, two kids. <laughs> 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 Even if I could just see where they are within like, a mile from the house, that, that would be useful. So yeah, yeah, I was totally yeah. thinking about that it's very early on in this, your presentation. I have a toddler at home, and I thought, brilliant. Yeah. It would be fantastic to see what his temperature is, what's wrong with him if he's sick, and especially where the heck is he? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 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 It was made about the black box, the insurance. I think it was a Viva. I can't remember it was. It was yeah. I worked on that project. And, yeah. Yeah. And, and it's just a brilliant idea because it, it's totally changing that. The idea of uh, in, we're in a strange place where people are putting all sorts of information out there quite willingly and perhaps not being cognizant of the consequences and trying to look for somebody else to be held to account. But actually, when it's reversed and the proposal is actually this is really beneficial to you and you're going to get benefits from 
having this information feedback to you in a useful way, it's almost a no-brainer of that stuff. I think, well, great, and this business of vitality in South, South Africa. You know? Yeah, they were big innovators in that space. Mm -hmm. it, sounds, it sounds incredible. It's, you know, what I, an amazing I cannot imagine it selling to teenagers. A gadget that tells their parents at any time where they are. <laughs> 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 Apple do it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. teenagers aren't stupid. They'll find ways around it, like we did when we were teenagers. <laughs> yeah. It's Just, not yeah. incredible. But can you actually be traced where you are with a chip like this? N no, I mean, you, you couldn't unless someone read it and uploaded that but information. How does it work with cats? It's a different thing. Uh, um, the cats have it for identification. Yeah. Yeah, they don't have it for tracking. It's, it's, it's only when they pass by readers. Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah. so you need to do, so I have a dog, and when we go to France, we put the dog in the, in the, in the boot, and the guy comes and scans the ID card, and it kind of reflects the system so yeah. that stolen dogs won't be a problem anymore. Okay. It's more on that side I'm, rather I'm than the it. tracking. I suppose, again, the listing is all the benefits, and <coughs> it feels like there's a, a Rubicon, you can cross a Rubicon when you decide to have an implant because it, it's less easy to change, I think, the, the mindset. So when you talked about the um, adoption of online payments and how long that took, and all of a sudden there seems to be, it just went away, and so many people were doing it. The, the difference with having it implanted, this idea of how accessible the actual device is, as opposed to this, which is like another vital organ that I carry around, that this is something that's always with me and has so much on it. I feel that, um, I suppose if I use the kitten again, a friend of mine has um, a company called Paw Tracker, and he's been doing this for years, and it's basically what we were talking about. So you can't, with uh, the reading, the, the chips that you read track, but with another device, obviously you can, and when it can relate to one of those things, I can take the device, the secondary device, put it on the child if I want to, and sync it up to that chip, and okay, that's then currently it's locked onto that. You know, all, all of these things are possible, and it feels like at a certain point, when the, the value proposition for the device and the service have proved themselves, <laughs> then embedding it seems a no-brainer. Especially with the infrastructure that comes with it. I think the value discussion yeah. needs to happen in the, the ecosystem and the ability to do the ease of it. Yeah. And as soon as that convenience factor will be a massive, where the adoption will increase significantly when they get the yeah. value and the, the ecosystem mm -hmm. and infrastructure to support it. So the last question for me is how often do you organize the implanting sessions? <laughs> yeah, so currently we're looking at every two weeks, uh, one session. So they're not so frequently. Um, but and it's better to do it with more than one person at a time, is it? It's yes. economies of scale. <laughs> it's economies of scale. So uh, we're hoping to, to get more uptake with the marketing that we do and with the optimizing um, um, uh, software products that are out there and obviously like the convenience factor and, and, and building um, systems around that. So um, hopefully then to run a, a place that has a constant flow. Um, that's the future. Hopefully. Now you're looking for more investment, for more employees, or more partners, or what? What's the um, we are looking. We're very interested in partnerships. We're very interested in hearing about you know possible uh, problems that we can solve. Um, we are looking into investment. Um, uh, um, at some stage, we're applying for grant um, and grant money from the UK to develop further products and linking that up with our um, kind of. Uh, um, investment rounds that we're going through. So we are looking for investment um, later on this year, so if anyone's interested um, on that front, um, we'd also be very happy to speak. Final questions from the audience? Is there a waiting list? Is there a waiting list? There are some people on, on, on the list, because as we organize these events bi-weekly, uh, we, we always gather all the people and then uh, do one of these events. So um, there's not a waiting list per se in terms of uh, devices, but um, but uh, but there are people on the list that are in the next uh, cohort of uh, of sessions that we are running. Okay. Julia, so I have, I have a question. So we're talking about technology. We're talking about uh, insurance companies that would possibly uh, incentivate the use of uh, implants. Uh, we're talking about doors being opened uh, through our implant. What about those countries that cannot afford? Um, to have such doors, for example, uh, if suddenly uh, the, the implants get adopted, and hopefully yes, um, and, um, and all those countries that can afford it, they they actually do. How will the other countries deal with it? They they will they will be kind of an exclusion uh, discrimination. You, uh, well, you you have that with every technology, right? 
when the first mobile phone was invented, not, not everyone could afford it because they were quite expensive devices if they were for sure first adopted in, in certain regions and not in others. You'll, you'll have that with, with, with commercial technology sure. for sure to some, to some degree. Um, however, it very much depends on, on, on the need you're trying to solve in certain, in certain areas with this technology. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be in this very commercial space. It could be in a, in a very non-for-profit way. You, know? right. you could say we're helping um, immigrants keep their medical data on them at all times because we know that they travel a lot, which means that they don't have their medical records with them. Um, so there are non-for-profit ways where you could bring that to people or um, or like in, 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 in Africa where, you know, a, a lady might uh, might give birth in one clinic and might end up in another, you know, um, and, and you might want to have the patient record with her rather than with the clinics itself. Mm. Um, and as everyone now has a mobile device, um, wherever mine is, <laughs> um, uh, as everyone now has a mobile device, even uh, even in the in the developing countries, um, I think it's um, it's an interesting aspect of this technology actually being used for good applications out there. Absolutely, yes, please don't take my question as critic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, it, it was more, since we were talking about uh, um, um, disease prevention uh, and monitoring, very precise uh, monitoring of our health conditions, um, my, it was more like a yeah. critical question. Yeah. But it's not for you to no. decide, obviously. No, no, no. And um, that, that is very true, and I think that we should use use technology for good. And I think there should be aspects out there, and we're looking at, you know, trying to find aspects that could be really helpful in the non-for-profit sector, and yeah. where where these technologies can actually also be used, where you know they are actually needed. So, if anybody in the room has such an idea, or if anybody watching the video in due course has such an idea, uh, get in touch with simply. Yes, please. I'll ask you to thank uh, Anna Louise in a minute. I'll just mention a couple of other things. Uh, there is a chance to continue this discussion informally. I uh, will move out of this room shortly and move towards a nearby pub. So if those are uh, interested in uh, having a wider discussion about uh, futurism, wider discussion about the good things that can happen with technology and the risks we have to face up to, then uh, it's a chance to do that in the pub. We also have online discussions. There are various things. There's a Slack that's if you go to londonfuturist.com, you'll see a link and an invite to uh, London Futurist Slack, which is another possibility to discuss things. Forthcoming meetings coming up, as I mentioned already, in three weeks' time there's uh, an event with the speaker Martin Dinoff, who is going to talk about uh, what can we sense about the human mental state, how can we do that by analysing voice and other things, and how can we accelerate uh, more people being in a good mental state as a result of these tools and a better awareness of our uh, mental state. There are a number of other London Futures meetings. I'm giving a talk myself, not in Birkbeck, but in Newspeak House. I think it's on the 5th of March, which is in the middle of the week, on what I call towards a techno-progressive New Deal, which is what are the social changes necessary to get the best benefits for everybody for technology rather than just uh, uh, possibly uh, benefiting the rich or the well-off. So that's a, a broader discussion. You'll find other things online too. I found this a very useful discussion. I'm much wiser now about the various opportunities that are here and now. Of course, I'm still interested in nanobots in due course, mm -hmm. but I realize that the full Kurzweilian vision of nanobots rejuvenating me might uh, be later than the very practical solutions that are being developed here now. So, Anna Louise, thanks very much. Uh, it's been a real pleasure having you. Thank you.